Chris, what a week in AI drama it was. In fact, I thought this week we'd be talking about maybe the release of new models, more fallout from the GPT store. But instead, the very next day after releasing our last episode, I got a text actually from our brother saying, check the news. And I immediately was like, oh, no, terrorist attack or something like that. But it really was terrorism on OpenAI. <laughs> the OpenAI board self-destruction mode has been activated. So I thought for people listening that may have not been addicted to X following the blow by blow of the drama, I would give a somewhat written recap of all the facts uh, that I've painstakingly gone through and made sure all the detail in this overview of exactly what happened is, you know, perfectly factually correct as best as I could using <laughs> numerous sources. Well, that would be good because it was really quite stressful to follow, I found. Like, there was so much going on and so many gear shifts and change in, in the narrative and what the reasons were and all that, that I think for those who didn't follow it that closely, getting a time-by-time -time, uh, summary of it would be great. So... Let me recap it for you, and then I'd love to talk about the one remaining question, which I still feel is unanswered, which is, why did they fire him in the first place? So, for those that didn't follow it, the events really began for Sam Altman in Las Vegas, of all places, last <laughs> Friday, US time. So, picture this, Sam's in his hotel room, at the place to be for the weekend, which is the Formula One for the first time in Las Vegas. And he had just finished hanging up some photos of himself in his hotel room, which he likes to do, I'm told, when he gets to hotel rooms. And then he meditates to the chant in his mind, feel the AGI. <laughs> but all, <laughs> of, a, all of a sudden his phone let out a ding and it was time to log into a Google Meet for a meeting with none other than Ilya Sitskeva, who had asked him to attend this very important call. And on the call was none other than Australian Helen Toner, a do-gooder effective altruist who specializes in professional virtue signaling and solving problems that don't yet exist. And uh, Helen was joined by Yahoo Answers clone maker and former super trustworthy Facebook executive and now creator of Poe, Adam D'Angelo. There's also on the call Tasha McCauley, who we're told is a CIA spy who goes by the cover of being a senior management scientist at a company that sounds definitely made up, Rancorp. Uh, <laughs> they describe themselves as a policy non-profit. I, I have no idea what that means. So finally, the only one who actually knows anything about AI, Ilya Sitskeva, is all dialed in, ready to deliver the big news to Sam. He's, he's surely revved himself up to deliver the news that the shocking news that Altman is being fired. He's immediately locked out of his computer and he jumps on the first flight back to his house in San Francisco in Russian Hill, which he deems... Ooh, Russian Hill's a nice area. Yeah, very nice. There. Very nice house, I'm told. So Summer HQ is what, what we're referring to it as. So... Moments later, they tell Greg Brockman that he is now removed as chair of the board. And inside OpenAI HQ, everyone's in complete shock. Sam Altman is out and Greg Pro Brockman promptly resigns behind him in support using all lowercase letters to resign on X. <laughs> so now Mira Moretti, who you might remember as the former CTO of OpenAI, is now the interim CEO and the executive team, we're told, is handed a crisis communications pack. But this pack, get this, has absolutely zero talking points about what actually happened. So, I like that it's a pack. Does it have like some, <laughs> some drugs in there or some like, I don't know. It's a pack with nothing in it. Uh, so OpenAI then proceeds to post a vague blog post, which is still actually the main blog post up on their website right now that effectively explains nothing about what happened. So then you've got Moretti and Sitskeva at this point leading an all-hands meeting and then proceeding to try and explain what Summer did, which is to say that they literally explained nothing because no one knew what was going on. So what the management team now did is they regrouped, 
demanded a call with the board and wanted to know exactly what had happened. What what had he actually done? And in reply, they were told, for legal reasons, we actually can't tell you anything. (laughs) For legal reasons, the excuse of people who don't want to tell the truth. So fast forward to Altman, who's now on the phone to Satya Nadella, fan of the world's second best cricket team. And as Microsoft's bitch, Satya knows that he's got to reinstall Sam Altman immediately to open AI. So he sets apart to undo absolutely everything that has happened and get Sam reappointed as the CEO. So at this point, Altman starts blaming himself for ever putting women on the board in the first place. Women have been causing all sorts of issues for Sam Altman on the board, with Tona publishing papers dishing OpenAI for lack of regard for safety. And unlike her favorite altruists over at Sex Cult Anthropic, who, you know, are withholding releases and just aren't as good because they're withholding releases. So back at Sam's house, all the early employees are plotting how to get Sam reinstated so their share sale still goes ahead because you'll recall that at a $90 billion valuation, by being able to sell their secondary shares, they'll all be surely rich as hell if these dumb investors keep believing all the hype. So Moretti is there as well, helping plot Sam's return. So then they begin using the X platform like some weird cult chant, signaling their love of money and reminding everyone what's at stake, a share sale at 90 billion. And they use various signals such as, I love open employees so much, and all these silly heart emojis to sort of say, we're on board, we want this share sale to continue. (laughs) So on Sunday, Moretti sends a note to the staff saying, Altman will be returning to the office to take one last selfie. She's trying to lead a rebellion against the board as now CEO to get Altman back in charge and ensure she can still buy that vacation home with the share sale money that she was about to get. Meanwhile, the board is plotting to find a new CEO and they later announce the appointment of Emmett Shear, the former CEO of Twitch, who is allegedly also an altruist like our beloved Australian Helen Toner. A statement is then released saying it stood by, the board stood by its decision and that they thought Altman's behavior and lack of transparency had undermined the board's ability to effectively supervise the company in a manner that it was mandated to do. So Sam's structure now has turned against him, the the structure of the board he created. So on OpenAI Slack, it's now riddled with thumbs down emojis. And it's the most thumb down emojis that have ever been used since a recent RHLF blitz on a new model at the company. (laughs) But never fear, never fear. Microsoft's bitch will now go inside the beast. Altman and Greg announced that along with Satya, they're going to join Microsoft and do Microsoft's dirty work from within Microsoft's buildings in San Francisco instead. And Altman will be the CEO of this new division, and they quickly made all this up to leverage, uh, to you know, gain leverage in the negotiation and also turn the, the PR story around. These are all facts um, that, that we've found out. Uh, so he'll take key employees with him if they don't reappoint him the king um, of OpenAI, and he's super serial about it at this point. So... The board still doesn't budge. And the next day on X, they start another cult-like chant saying OpenAI is nothing without the secondary sale. I mean, (laughs) OpenAI is nothing without its people, sorry. So everyone is signing a letter pledging loyalty to the AGI overlord and key Microsoft bitch Summer at this point because they really want this sale to go ahead. Then Ilya realizes through the tears, the tears of Greg Brockman's wife, Anna Brockman, that without money, He can't really do any of this stuff. So he might have to put up with some of these commercially minded eye contact making folks after all. So he (laughs) tweets out, I deeply regret my participation in the board's actions, even though I am on the board and fired Sam Altman myself. So Sam is finally reinstated after a little bit more drama and Tona and the CIA spy are now off the board. Adam D'Angelo remains because they still need to access his data that he has on Yahoo Answers clone Quora for training until they can figure out how to cut him out with either user data or synthetic data to train with. So Microsoft's bitch is officially back. 
all the women who caused all of this drama on the border now gone and still no one knows why the fuck it all happened. <laughs> Unbelievable. What a crazy thing. And so we've gone full circle. He's, he's back there. Nothing's really changed. <laughs> yeah, so after <laughs> all that, nothing happened. So that's the end of that. <laughs> so what? So the crazy craziness of this all is, and, and we'll talk about this Q-Star news in a moment that's been that's been all over uh that it's really all anyone's been talking about since this drama ended but it seems like one big look over here distraction to me we still don't know what sam altman actually did no one has said anything and for them to go ahead and so aggressively and so in such a calculated way remove this guy you would think there's some legit reason for it right like all jokes aside it just doesn't seem like something you would do when the company is very successful has built arguably one of the the best technology products ever in the world and then you just go fire the leader yeah and i think that it was interesting because when it first occurred everyone was saying the level of language they used in the announcement in the corporate world was a sort of scorched earth, really harsh criticism. So the way they did it to him, there was no coming back from that. It's not like they came out and said, well, we've decided to part ways, our wonderful journey, whatever. They came out and basically said, this guy has done something egregious and he's gone for, for merit. So he must. there must have been some catalyst. It seems weird that they would just make it up to because they were were unhappy about some commercial arrangement or something else. And they talked about his lack of transparency. So clearly there was some sort of information within the company that came to light that caused them to make that decision. But it's other than speculation, it's not clear at all what that information was. Yeah. And it seems like for all of the businesses and corporate entities, including Microsoft in all seriousness, (laughs) investing billions of dollars in this company these are the kind of answers that you're going to want, right? To trust this company ever again. You're going to want to know, well, why did you just fire your CEO? And then essentially through blackmail or, or unionization of the team, bring him back. And That's right. So clearly he's come back in a position where they don't believe in his ability to do the job, but they did it out of force because they had no alternative. It's, it's not like, oh, actually we were wrong. He can do the job just fine. It's like they still presumably have the same belief if it was ever a true belief to begin with. It also turned this idea on its head that, oh, if we invent AGI, like he's been saying it the whole time, like, oh, don't worry, the structure I've set up means I can be fired and removed if I turn evil. Yep, and clearly, it turns yes, out it can he be. can't be. But yeah, I, I think the thing that just sticks with me about the whole thing, and I don't understand American corporations so well, but this whole idea that this is a non not for profit, it's meant to be some sort of altruistic thing. And yet it seems quite money related. Like money seems to be at the core of why he came back. Yeah, I think I, I think you can't I mean I joke about it a lot, but you just can't If you break down, like, what are the motivations from the team banding together to get him back? Look, he he might be the best leader in the world ever. And they've built a phenomenal product, phenomenal APIs. Like, full credit to them. Like, what they've done is amazing. Outside of all the, like, AGI hype, even if ChatGPT was the best thing they ever delivered to the world, I think that's been phenomenal in and of itself. But my key issue here is, like, you know, why you know, what other motivations were there to bring the guy back? And they were literally about to do this $90 billion secondary share sale. For those that don't know, it means early employees could sell to new investors as part of a new funding round and basically cash out some of their their stock. Or... They're cashing it out for altruistic reasons, I'm sure. Yeah. It's and... like, I don't understand this. Like, it's like people these days want to be some like seen in one sense as, oh, all I do is good for the world. I don't care about money, but also I'll take tons of money from what I do. I don't I've always understand. thought it was a weird thing in Silicon Valley myself where people can't be honest and just say like, you know, I love the job. I've created something great, but also, you know, I want to enrich myself from that. And I honestly think for people that build such phenomenal products like ChatGPT, 
it should be okay to be like, we're going to build AGI or whatever that's going to help the world. And we also want to make a lot of money from it because we're the ones doing it. And what's so wrong with that? Like, why well, does also, everything have to have yeah, these like, fake motives? Seeing money as a scorecard. Like, if, if money's coming in for it, well, it's popular and good and people are responding well to it and we can continue to invest. If no one's willing to pay for it, then maybe you don't have something. So... Yeah, it always, the whole time it seemed odd to me, but now all these machinations around $90 billion share sales and like the PO being a competitor and if that's a factor in the thing, it all seems money related. It doesn't seem about AGI at all to me. No, and I, I personally feel like all these rumors and speculations about, oh, they had made a breakthrough and that's why Sam was fired because the board was concerned it would kill all humans. I'm really not buying it. It feels like... If you were on Sam Altman's team or the, the publicist at OpenAI, the way you would distract everyone right now is to be like, oh, it, you know, they were just worried, but, you know, Sam was going to do right by everyone. And, you know, it, it just seems like something you would throw out there to distract the Twitterati, which is exactly what it's done. I think the reason I'm so sure that they're not sitting on some massive announcement or some massive AGI that we're not aware of is the fact that, the open source models are always nipping at the heels of the leading models. So they've got GPT vision. Then you look at something like Lava and it's almost as good. Okay. It's not as good as GPT-4 vision, but it's close. And then you've got the image creation ones. They had Dali. And then we saw things like Stable Diffusion, which can run open source and things like that. They're always just a couple of small steps behind on the open source front. And a lot of it comes down to money for training and access to data sets. It isn't like they're, they're such orders of magnitude ahead that they're sitting on something that's just a hundred times better than what they have now. And then they'll suddenly release that. I just, I just fail to believe that that's the case. Yeah, no, I, I'm completely in agreement there. I, I just, you know, I'm trying to still get a sense of what brought these individuals to overthrow this guy essentially. And Obviously, Ilya Sitskeva was at the heart of that because he said, I, you know, I regret it. Um, and he was the guy that delivered the news to Sam that he was out. So did he band together with this Helen, Helen Toner and the CIA spy to like concoct a plan to overthrow him? And, and why? Because these seem like really intelligent people to me that, you know, understand the position of this company in the world and like everyone's obviously saying this is a debate between these decelerators and accelerators of, of AGI. But the real question I have is like, I don't think it's like that. Surely it's not that religious in that they're like, we must slow this guy down. And they didn't think through the fact he would just go work somewhere else. Yeah. My initial take on it, and I know there's been a lot of news come out since, but I just thought it must have been related to the whole GPTs thing and the commercialization, mass commercialization of what they had built. And perhaps there's factions within the company where one faction wants to really truly build AI to supposedly help humanity or whatever, and they really want to focus on that. And then the other side just wants to make money by commercializing what they've done and cash in on it. And so my initial take was, okay, well, the the a the AGI people have won by kicking him out. Like as in they just want to work on the tech and they don't really mind about the money side of things. But it seems to me like the vast majority of them do care about the money based on what happened subsequently. So that theory doesn't quite hold up. I just think that GPTs alone, for those of us who've worked with this technology for a while, just aren't that impressive in terms of what they do. They're not a paradigm shift. They're a, a small logical step in terms of applying the technology that they've made. It isn't like suddenly they came out with something and certainly not something that could lead to such dramatic action. Like they really, like I mean it with Scorched Earth, the way they did it, it was very hard. To, I mean, they did come back from it as it happened, but they were clearly knowing they were either going to damage their or someone else's reputation by what they did, they could have done it a lot more smoothly and yet they chose not to. Yeah. It, it, and I think we should talk about that, like the, the damage that's been done. My, my take on it was that potentially what's happened is there's been some 
breakthrough in fine tuning models or some new technique that has allowed these models to follow instructions much better and maybe take more time in reasoning about a, a plan. So if you give them a goal, you know, potentially, because we know instruction following is like a huge problem. It eventually goes haywire. And we've known this since we first started this podcast and we started experimenting around with this stuff is that this idea of an aut autonomous agent with the current models just isn't possible because they go absolutely nuts after a while. So right now we're in this phase where if you give it a series of instructions, it's quite good at following those. But if you ask it to sort of plan its own instructions infinitely and goal set, it's bad. So maybe they were planning in the near future or next year or whenever to release a version of GPTs that were, you know, an early form of autonomous agents. And that's what maybe freaked them out because it would unleash all of these agents on the web. The, the problem with that theory, and I completely disagree that that's what's going on, is that they're a freaking AI company. They're sitting around trying to make the best AI they can, right? They've mentioned AGI repeatedly. Is it really a shock to the board if they happen to invent something that is a, a for, like a big step towards it? Like, it, oh, they they did what they said they were going to do. You better fire him. Like, and and then lack of transparency. It's all moved so fast since the start of this year. It's like, has he really been so poor at communication? He's like, oh shit, I totally forgot to mention we made AGI. Like, and they're pissed off about it. It just doesn't add up. It doesn't make sense that you would be like surprised that they made some huge strive towards the thing that they're spending billions of dollars striving to do. But this is the big problem, right? Is like, we can hypothesize and I've logically sort of gone down every path of what it could be. And you're like, okay, none of this makes any sense whatsoever. Like, unless he's got some Theranos type bullshit going on there, um... What What is like, you know, uh, it just doesn't, none of these reasons make sense why you would go and fire the guy. Like he's on top of the world. They're literally crushing it. They've got the best models, the best product. And then you've got a board, like you said, who knows, like they're, they're up on the stage every day being like AGI and they're chanting AGI like a cult. Well, and surely, except for maybe the Cora guy, Open AI has got to be the best thing going on in their lives. Like if you're one of these rando Aussie ladies on the board who like doesn't have direct experience in AI, you're just like an altruist governance person. You must be like, this is the best thing that's ever happened to me. These guys have made all this amazing tech. I can get out there and talk about it, take credit for it and make a shitload of money off my not-for-profit shares. Why in the world would you do something that jeopardizes that in such a serious way. Like they must have known that at least some people worship this guy and it's going to have fallout. Like you wouldn't have done this thinking, oh, it'll be fine. No one will mind as long as we replace him with someone the same day. Um, it'll be all right. And like, wouldn't you also, like there's obviously a sense of urgency around this because then they're thinking, okay, well, wouldn't you go and find a new CEO secretly in the background or at least yeah. spread leaks into the media of what he's done wrong to like start to build a case internally that this guy's bad? Or even even come back to what they had said when they were doing all the governance stuff earlier in the year. Guys, we need to take a pause here. Like everything's happened so fast. We've got to get rid of this guy due to his poor communication. <laughs> like he's so shit at it. Um but we need a few months to figure out what we're going to do here and replace him with the CEO. Yet the whole thing was so hastily done. Like it was so childish and amateurish. Like it, there was nothing. You think about regular companies that are worth $90 billion, even ones that are worth a couple of billion dollars. They don't act this rashly. Like when's the last time you saw like BHP or something like that, just f randomly firing people and, doing all these power plays and stuff. It just doesn't happen. This this just really has that that feeling of little children bickering or something. Like it just, I don't know. It just, the whole thing just doesn't seem thought thought through. Even, Gre even Greg Brockman where he's like, when I quit then, sandwich out, I quit. And he's like doing it in all lowercase. Like he's never capitalized a letter. Like, you know, it, it felt so childish, like you said. I know, I know nothing about this guy, but... I read that he got married at the OpenAI office and that his wife is in the lobby crying about all of this. It just seems like you're married to the company or what the hell is going on here? It's just a bit weird. 
Yeah, it's starting to look more and more like the real sex cult is open AI, not anthropic. It, it really does have... When we lived in San Francisco, it very much had this feeling of a bubble. And I don't mean a bubble in the sense of like shares and, and value and inflation and whatever. What I mean is you're in that world and everyone in that world you interact with is in the tech industry and has opinions and knows people and all that sort of stuff. And I remember having to physically leave on the weekends to go for a trip somewhere to break out of that bubble. And then you think about the people at the higher echelons of that, and it's even more so that that world for them. And I just think that a lot of them are living in an alternate reality. And it's just weird. Like who gets married at their own office? Like that's just weird. Yeah, I agree with you. I think there's a reality distortion field and that distortion field is also around this whole idea of how close we might be to some AGI event. I think everyone's saying it's accelerating now because so many people are focusing on the ideas and concepts and problem solving around it. But I can say from direct experience of working with these technologies and trying to build like memory and task planning and i know we're not training models and i'm not suggesting like we're we're very good at this but just trying to piece together the technologies that are available today it feels like we're further than ever from you know these things being at a point where it feels like your computer or device is sentient i agree i mean look it routinely delights me I spend all the time sending you messages and things of look at what it did look how cool this is look how good this is. But almost all of that is a result of us combining it in different ways, like different models with different prompts or giving it tools and seeing how it uses them. One of the things that really excites me is when you give, and we've been talking about this in the Discord, you give the AI the discretion. Do you want to use these tools? Do you want to remember something? And then when it chooses to do that, it really does feel like sparks of an intelligent. That's exciting, but it isn't an actual intelligence and it isn't like, oh shit, I've nearly accidentally made AGI here. It's like I've made such a progression. You can see the the infancy of it. You could see how that model may look in the future. But uh, like, I just don't think if they were sitting on something that was so unbelievably far ahead of this, that there would be the urgency to remove him. Like, had it leaked that they did have some epic evolution of the technology it was about to come out he was insisting they release it or something like that and there was no going back from it i can understand the urgency to remove him but even let's say they're sitting on agi right now they have it and they're like we better fire him before he announces it at a dev day i just i think they could have resolved that internally you don't need to like shut off his laptop and and throw the guy out in the cold when he was one of the founders of the company yeah, and I, I think the we can go into it in a moment. The allegation there is that, you know, Ilya Sitskeva had presented this idea of of Q learning, which is reinforced learning where essentially a, a model or an AI can learn on the fly. So in the leaked example in a Reuters article, they they talk about that it could solve elementary maths problems. Uh, on its own without ever having seen the problem before just by reasoning is the allegation. Yeah. Now, I think this could be one of two things. I think one, it could be a complete and utter distraction to be like, look how amazing we are um, and diverting people's attention from the fact that they aggressively fired the CEO and why <laughs> is he now back? <laughs> or it could be that they're about to do this share sale. They want it to go ahead. So they've got to keep pumping the hype up in the company yeah, like before they dump. It's like, don't worry, guys, we're actually the, the goat in this industry. Yeah. Look, I looked into that and I must admit, I don't fully understand it. I know the A-star algorithm, which is like a problem-solving pathfinding algorithm that's existed in computer science for ages. This one seems like a more efficient method of doing that, where it doesn't have to follow every single path or something like that. But as someone pointed out on X, um, Google released a paper about this like four months ago it isn't like some new concept that's come from nowhere. And then everyone's automatically saying, okay, well, this thing's 126 times more efficient than the last one. Therefore, imagine if GPT-4 was 100 times better. But that's not really how it works. Like its ability to solve problems 
is separate from its large language model capability. So you're talking about a sort of separate ability that you would be giving it uh, on top of that. And I must admit, I don't understand it from a technical perspective, but I don't think a few dot points in a screenshot somebody shared is enough to say, okay, they've cracked it, guys. This is it. Um, just sit back and wait for them to take over the world. It just, it just seems pretty weak to me. And I, just this whole week has made me think that they're a lot further away from the real juicy uh, AGI stuff than ever. Like, well, sorry, not than ever. That doesn't make sense. But they're no closer. And I don't think that anything that's happened this week suggests that that something big has happened on that front. Yeah, and I think there's a lot of evidence by what they've been doing. For example, the idea of a GPT store and GPTs in general seems like a way to further to capitalize on the success of ChatGPT, knowing full well that, you know, they've got to sort of monetize this as best as possible as opposed to having some new innovation. And then they can just slowly iterate, which I'm assuming is Sam Altman's path here, to making it more of an autonomous agents that you can set up to do tasks for you. And then eventually, as we discussed last week or the week before, maybe that master sort of LLM OS as uh, Kapathi is calling it now is this command center of those other LLMs. And I can totally see that being the slow path to getting to, you know, a, a more useful assistant or better autonomous agent. But I still don't think that's going to be AGI. I'm not stupid. Yeah, I agree with you. I think it's a logical progression. And I think everyone who's working with the technology is realizing that you need to give it abilities to call tools. You need to have it acting as different agents, which you can then empower with certain skills. You need to run those in an autogen style simulation where they work together and solve problems together. You need to have this sort of always on mode where they have short term, long term memories and things like that. They need to have different kinds of input. So not just text, but like vision and tone of voice and audio and all that sort of stuff. It is a natural and logical progression. And I don't begrudge them releasing GPTs also. It makes a whole lot of sense that you would want to commercialize the thing you made, earn enough money to ensure the future existence of your organization. Similar to Elon Musk says he does with SpaceX and Starlink. Like I'm doing it to make money so I can further the overall mission of the company. Even as a not-for-profit, it makes sense to do GPTs because it it sort of ensures the future of the company. But um, yeah, I... I, I I don't know. Like, I don't think that um, th- there's anything wrong with any of that. And I don't understand how any of that could lead to the sort of self-destruction that played out. Yeah, I think uh, to take a different tone on it, there's, there was this tweet, just a sort of reality check for everyone. This is by um, Aaron Levy, who's the CEO at Box. And, and he... I think he sums this up quite well. He says, the problem we have in AI right now is not that it's getting too powerful. It's that it's not nearly powerful enough. Very little has changed thus far because of AI and won't until models get faster, cheaper, more accurate, and more intelligent. Building safe AI is insanely important, but any goal that is half in and half out of driving progress overall seems to make little sense. Yeah, but that's just such a pedestrian, obvious comment to make. That sounds like it was generated by freaking AI, that comment. Like, it just doesn't. What's he saying? Oh, I I actually don't think it's come far enough. Like, okay, fair enough. Well, you go do it, mate. Box is a piece of crap anyway. I don't really, yeah. <laughs> well, this I, wasn't the response I thought I would get from you. I, nah. I guess my point is more, you know, Point to things that it's changed in your life. And we we've, we go over this every few shows. Like point to things right now, it's actually changed about your life. And what? It helps us write the odd repeating function and answer coding questions. And it's a good companion of a day while you work. And it's good at summarizing and categorizing information. But Yeah, not- true. But also like... Personally, I'm not I'm not claiming that it should have done more than that. I'm excited to be involved in it because of its potential and because of the things I can do in existing software to make it better or just use it as a sort of awesome API that can do almost anything and um or just experimenting with what it can do with different configurations and different sizes and things like that. It's for me it's it's hope and excitement and just fun to play with and in that respect it's changed my life because it's given me something that has brought back my excitement in programming and technology 
So I, 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 I get it. People are trying to, to run it out to its logical conclusion, but why do you have to do that? Like, can't you just see it for what it is and enjoy it? I, I obviously agree with you. And I thought that was very well put, but I guess what I'm saying is like it going back to the open AI drama, it keeps pointing back to this fact that it must be just politics because when you just said that we're talking about, this is in its infancy. This is a hobbyist thing right now in reality. And there's some, you know, okay use cases like GitHub Copilot is, is a great product. There's some great products starting to show up and, uh, we'll talk a little bit later about the one we've been having a lot of fun with on the Discord community called yeah. Suno. Um, <laughs> but but you know what I mean? Like, I think that it probably points to this being a big bust up internally of all of these people, like you said earlier, in this Silicon Valley bubble where they're inventing problems that don't exist. And maybe that got in their heads and... And I think there's a lot of ego at that company. I saw a tweet you sent during the week where the guy from Salesforce, Benioff, was trying to poach the employees and some guy like screenshotted and embarrassed him and being like as if I'd come work at a company that made to blow, which I don't think they even did. I think they bought it, which shows how stupid that guy is. But just this sort of arrogance that like we're so much further above everyone else that nobody dare even approach us and what we decide matters and communicating in emojis with thumbs up and middle fingers and it's like you're so intelligent but your communication is like tweets and and emojis it's like it's just childish lame stuff and i don't think that people like that have ever been the ones to influence society and i think that what they've done is great they started a movement that's really interesting and will form some role in the future but to act like open ai is the only company that's making good technology and understands the technology is just ridiculous and i think what they've done here is severely harmed their reputation they've completely ruined their chances at big corporations trusting them with their technology and i think if anything they've just given a huge huge boost to microsoft who's making real and substantial announcements who handled this situation like absolute pros. They were like, look, we'll take on your best guys and we've built a floor for you in the LinkedIn office and whatever. Um, But also we're announcing all this great technology, including open source models. And I just feel like OpenAI has sort of made themselves seem like a bit of a bubble company and a bit of a hype train. And I just wonder if this has been the sort of look, it'll take them a while to die. But I just wonder if this is the thing that's sort of given them the fatal blow and other companies will rise up and be the ones who who succeed in the long run. Yeah, it does seem like that success has led to a lot of fame and fortune and personality clashes. I mean, that's so evident from the fact Ilya Sitskeva went in to initially fire him. Potentially, it was just jealousy. Like, this guy is out there taking credit when really it was me that joined OpenAI. I was recruited in by Elon Musk. Um, I, you know, essentially invented all this stuff and all these other guys are building on the shoulders of, of me being one of the giants. And now they're taking all the credit for it. You've got like that arrogant little guy, little child on Twitter, essentially like defaming Benioff over a pretty kind offer and a bit of hustle, which is, I think, cool to see. Yeah, I agree. Um, I think it was fine and I think it was funny and it was good. And um and why not? And I yeah, I I actually agree and I think that it sounds like a simplistic e- explanation. There's also the Poe connection, the fact that Poe was trying to do what GPTs is and then they just come out and announce something that which would make Poe somewhat redundant, not completely, but it wouldn't help. Um and you just you just wonder if they're like you said this guy's the the face of it and the other guys like well we're making this cool stuff and the GPTs thing kind of trivializes it and that isn't really what we're about that doesn't represent us we don't want that therefore let's get rid of him. It could have been that simple. I mean, you know, Adam on the board could have had the motivation that you know he didn't tell me about GPTs even though I mean anyone could have guessed that's the direction they were headed. Um, yeah. and you know, my, I'm now embarrassed because of this Poe thing. And so he, he was holding a grudge, but I get the impression that 
you know, the reason he's still on the board is either that was just an agreement to save face. Like you can stay on the board for a couple more months so it doesn't look like you wronged anyone. Yeah, but I mean, I would normally agree with you strongly on that, but they don't, they aren't exactly a forward thinking company when it comes to public perception. If they're (laughs) just randomly firing their CEO, like two days after he does a major presentation, like if you were going to think like that, you did it at the wrong time. I think there's still so much more to come out of this. Like I, this is not over. And I think there's going to be a lot of leaks and I think there's still going to be more bloodshed before this is over. I mean, even their sort of like scaffold of a board, how they could only agree on, you know, on on essentially three, three uh, pretty like safe picks on the board. Sam Altman's not even back on the board. He's going to want more power because we know he wasn't taking any money from from OpenAI, so he. He's either using it as some third-party investment vehicle or, you know, he just loves the power and fame. I just think the whole thing's pathetic and I really wish we didn't have to care about it because I care about the tech and what it can do for us. I think the one good thing, and this was pointed out very early on um, by our Discord community, is this is two thumbs up for the open source movement in the AI space because straight away everyone was like, well, which which uh, open source models am I going to use? Also the recent instability of ChatGPT and the OpenAI APIs. I think that's just a coincidence because they're releasing new features. I don't think it's related, but I think everyone's realizing if I'm going to use this seriously as a business or in my business or for my future, I need something I can control that isn't at the whims of, of these, these crazy tech people in their little bubble. Like, do you really want, the future of either that element of your life or that element of your business to be just like, oh, one day the board decided he didn't communicate well and then we just blew the whole thing up. I just, I think that that level of instability is going to to lead to rise of open source and the rise of companies like Google, maybe to a lesser extent, but Microsoft and probably Amazon doing really well by hosting models in a in a way that comes along with their reputation and history of, of reliability. Yeah, I mean, it was a an, a pretty obvious way to absolutely derail and shoot themselves in the foot. And if they think they can just recover over four or five days by by this, you know, ridiculous behavior and expect people to trust them, I, I think it opened a, a huge door for open source models to you know, get the attention they deserve and get people to realize like we better invest in these uh, and and invest at speed and, and try and really improve open source models. So there is an alternative because in the future, do you really want a singular company controlling some form of AGI or some form of intelligent compute? Like I certainly don't. I think it's as dangerous as hell. Yeah. At this point, they should rename their company to like Death Star AGI or whatever. They're, they're definitely not open. They're not a not-for-profit. Clearly, profit's pretty important to at least some of them. Everything that they stand for is a lie. So they they need to be honest about who they are, I think, as a company, or no one will trust them. And right now, they still have the best model, but only just. And I just don't think that's going to last. What I don't get as well is, and, and this is something we discussed really early on, and, and we got a lot of flack for it, I remember, when we first started this show. I remember early on being like upset by some of the comments that people would, you know, really scorn us for questioning Sam Altman's motives. But yeah, we did, didn't we? Yeah. Yeah, we copped a lot. Um, and like privately as well. Like I literally got messages scorning me over it. And one thing I find really intriguing about it is that, you know, what like we still don't know what this guy's motivation is, right? He proudly proclaims i've set up this structure so when the you know the supercomputer's born like i can't kill all humans or, or whatever it is but he doesn't profit from it we're, we're told he might be investing on the side and trying to enrich himself on the side by by using sort of the open ai moat to enrich others by giving them like you know better access to the model or or uh releases early and and things like that but you know I think that's the thing that Sam Altman needs to come out now and say is like, what's in it for him? Like what is actually in it for him? And if he was just transparent and the company was more transparent and said, look, these employees have built like one of the greatest 
new eras or at least ignited it this new era of computing um and and they should be enriched from it and i think that's fine like they should make a fortune from it but at least just come out and and be honest with everyone and and you know maybe flip back to a bit more openness and i think that's probably the only way now they could win back trust what i don't really understand is in the sort of x bubble chamber formerly twitter it does seem like everyone was cheering on this guy. But then when you step back now and look at it in terms of what do we know and what actually happened, should we be cheering on this company at all? Yeah, and I think a lot of it is this sort of new fashion, like the word altruism. If you look at the resume of that Australian board member of the company, it's like in 2015, she was at some altruism company. You've got Brockman Freed who had his altruism thing. You've got Anthropic with their altruism sex cult thing. I think it's a modern fashion. I think in that world, money isn't such a big deal for them because at any point they can just get billions of dollars of investment and whatever, like the money will come. They don't need to worry about that. I think it's fashionable to do the Elon Musk thing where it's like, look, I don't care about money. I sold all my houses. All I really care about is the future of the human race and having all this adoration for being seen as, oh, all I care about is other people. But I think it is. It's self-glorification. I think they want to be seen like gods. I think they want to be seen like above other people. And it's not just enough to have money anymore. I don't think the money, maybe truly the money doesn't matter to him. It's not a thing. He wants to be seen as a sort of historical figure. He wants to be seen as someone who's important. And the desire to be important is a is a really big deal on, you know, that what's that hierarchy of needs or whatever? It's it's really once you have everything else you can get in life, being seen as important is probably their their crowning achievement. And people will go to great lengths for that. And I just wonder if if that's what this is all about. I mean, you can see this demonstrated really well with Elon Musk. Like, the guy lives to be this sort of, like, tech hero and, you know, problem solver. We saw that during COVID when, you know, Tesla was making, uh, I don't know what they, you know, the breathing machines that they they needed. Um, mm-hmm. The and, respirators, is that what you mean? Yeah, and then they sort of tried to make that submarine thing when those kids were stuck and then he sort of lost his temper over it, apparently. So I, I think you sort of see those things where he's trying to be seen as this like virtuous person. And I think Altman in a way is probably jealous as well of the cult-like following that that someone like an Elon Musk has. And this is his way of having his own sort of cult following, like you say. And Yeah, and then your take that then the people who are actually making the tech within the company are like, hang on a sec, um, he didn't actually do any of that. Um, it's all us might have led to some sort of coup to overthrow the guy. Like, it sort of adds up when you look at it from that perspective. I just don't see why they're on the verge of some big payday. Uh, and and look, there's the majority of those guys would want this payday, why you would go and disrupt that. So I just, I'm not really buying it. I think maybe at the top, sure, but... Yeah, there's clearly some forcing mechanism that happened that led to the urgency because... That's the piece of information I think we're missing, regardless of what the reason turns out to be. There was some timely thing that happened that meant it had to be then and now. And I suppose and I hope that we'll find that out, but only for gossip reasons. I don't really care. So let me just define for everyone effective altruism, because I I feel like it's a definition that we should Who has like ineffective altruism? (laughs) Like, look, I try to help people, but I just end up making things worse. It's got to be the biggest two bullshit words on the planet. So effective altruism is a philosophical and social movement that advocates using evidence and reason to figure out how to benefit others as much as possible and taking action on that basis. These do not come across to me as people who care about other people. I think they think other people are shit and that they're the best. Like, I really don't... Like, do those people really come across to you like they deeply care about other people? Like, I think they care about other people in the abstract in terms of when I'm written in the history books, I'll be seen as an altruist. But I think when it comes to -to day-to-day helping people as if they give a single shit, well, you can see how that guy treated Benioff to see how, like, yeah. arrogant and, like, anti sort of, you know, this guy genuinely was like, hey, you can come and do stuff at my company if you've blown yours up. A pretty damn nice offer. 
this is a guy who really invented cloud, the, the whole cloud software, which paid for all these guys to F around. But also like it's someone offering you a job. You just say, no, thanks. If you don't want the job, you don't, be, you don't publicly embarrass them. <laughs> like, Jesus. So let's just get far away from this because I feel like we've sort of lingered on it enough now. Uh, and I mean, it had to be, it had to be spoken about, but look, my overall take is I really wish it didn't happen. It's a shame. It's a shame that these are the kind of people in charge of this technology, but Hey, maybe it's personalities and egos like that, that we needed to get it to the stage it's at and we're all benefiting from it. So we should shut up. So, I'm just seeing like how to, like, it's just su su such an absorbing topic. So in um, other news, I got my uh, free Sydney mug. Our merch store isn't a scam. So free <laughs> Sydney mug. We also have, oh, I, I should mention that as a, a bit of a, a break between topics here. We have our new, uh, some new merch available in the store. One of our shirts is M-S-F-T-S-B-T-C-H, which if you read it, it sort of says Microsoft's bitch, but it doesn't actually say Microsoft's bitch on the shirt. So... They're now available. Our whole store's just going to end up being in in jokes from Discord. <laughs> yeah, literally. Um, the other shirt available, if you're following the Q Star News, is I am uh, Q with a star shirt. Is also now available. I am Q Star. You can find all this on this day in AI merch. There's our plug. So moving on, um, Audrey Kapathy released an introduction to large language models video on YouTube. It's well worth watching. You can learn a tremendous amount from it. It's about an hour long and he goes into detail on explaining sort of how LLMs are trained, uh, the steps of training them, and then sort of the future and the future research areas that they're, they're working on. Um, and so on one of the slides and one of the pieces of the talk, he talks about this proposal of what he calls an LLMOS, so Large Language Model Operating System. And he's really been out there promoting this as potentially one future of computing where the, the CPU, so like the brain of the computer, becomes the large language model and the RAM, the memory, we've actually talked about this concept on the show before, is the context window. So that's like the... The, what it can hold in, in relative memory. And then the, the disk like on your computer would be um, a file system, which everyone might know as what we talk about a lot, RAG or, or embeddings, where you go and fetch relevant information for the LLM to consider as part of a, a decision or, or whatever it needs to do next. Yeah. Um, as part of that computer model, he has tools as well. So things like, a, you know, it can access a calculator, a, a Python interpreter, the, the terminal. It's like a week playing solitaire. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and it can browse the internet. And what he sort of proposes is this could be potentially the future of computing. And we've joked about this before on the podcast around this idea of, uh, in the Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, talking to the computer and then it goes off and talks to another computer. And we've sort of talked about it a fair bit on the last two episodes, this idea that these GPTs that people are building could eventually be the GPTs that this master LLM calls when it needs to get a, a specialist result. And these GPTs could eventually be fine-tuned to do very specific tasks. Um, so I'm curious, Chris, given we've spent a, a lot of time playing around with these concepts, do you think this is potentially the future of computing? Computing? No, I, I think <laughs> it's <laughs> segment over. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think it's a it's a neat idea, and I think everybody who's working with the tech has come to that conclusion that it makes sense to have some sort of controller that's able to access and do all that. But I feel like with the power of the technology, its ability to reason and those kind of things, there'll be another paradigm shift in computing that goes far beyond that. I feel like that's a pretty obvious thing, like agents communicating a central agent that runs it. But if you think about it, at some point with all the different models and all the different specialties of those models, there's going to be almost like a survivor, survival of the fittest battle. Like if I'm trying to get my mathematics problem solved, and there's 17 different GPTs, let's say, that do it. Which one does it pick? There's sort of, it, it's going to need a way to know which agents to interact with, which ones to use, um, and how to combine that information. So while I get it, you can extend that paradigm of the RAG, you can extend that paradigm of context window and whatever to a current von Neumann computer 
strategy and it sounds cool. I just don't think that that is what we're going to end up using. Like you just log in and it's like, hey, g'day, how you going? <laughs> I'm, I've had a few games of solitaire and now I'll load up your spreadsheets for you. Like I just, I just don't think that our future is AI running and like sitting there running windows and browsing the web. Like I just, I, I just think it's too simplistic. I don't have the solution. I don't know what the actual future is. I just think it's going to be another layer deeper at least than that. I think what everyone's trying to figure out right now is like, what are the steps that get us there? And there's obviously been through the week, all of the noise after Sam Altman returned, like oh, they discovered AGI, oh, Q-Star, this is it. You know, this is the moment. But, you know, going back to that essay I constantly reference on the show, um, that won an essay competition around like, what would we actually need to see to get to AGI? You know, even if you have some sort of self-learning capability uh, through this Q-Star method, it's still going to be such a long time before that translates into some, you know, being uh, that can take on a physical form or interact with the physical world and experiment and and do like... I, I just think we are so far away from that. So what I then think is, okay, well, what is that? What benefits do we get and see over time from from these things? And I think that maybe just the way we interact with our computers has already changed and is going to continue to, to go down that path where already we're so used to interacting, at least if you're in software development with a co-pilot or chat GPT all day, like you're just working with this thing. And if it can then be somewhat sentient and go on like task plan and self-improve and solve problems for you, where you're like, I'm trying to solve this problem. And then it goes off and thinks about it and comes back and it's solved that problem for you and then charges you a fee because that, you know, that <laughs> was quite heavy in compute. Um, and it could be executing some basic tasks for you. I think that's probably the immediate future that we're going to see here, which is like, maybe it's not an LLM OS, but maybe it's a form of these GPTs where you're like, hey, can you go solve this problem for me or do a security review of my app? And it, it's like, okay, I'm going to need a few hours to do that. And it goes off, does that, and then and Yeah, then comes and trust, back. I think trusting it to do, to do more and more. I, I like you, I, I'm constantly using those tools and- it can't always solve problems the first time. You got to work at it. You got to work with it to get through things. And particularly the main one for me is when I'm trying out models and I get all these different Python version conflicts and this module doesn't work with this module and all this sort of stuff. I'm just pasting in what happens on the console and we get there together in the end, we get it working. But it isn't this flawless thing where if I just gave it a terminal and said, okay, I really want to try out the new stable diffusion video thing. Here's the hugging face link. Go make it work for me. Like there's no way it could do that now. You would, you would have to build a dedicated product with the sole purpose of that goal, which can run those commands, knows, has a, a appropriate prompts and those kind of things. And so I think to get to the next phase of problem solving in personal computing, you would need that. You would need something that can take a generic problem. It knows all of the different resources it's going to need to get that done and can translate that goal into actual actions. And I just, I don't know about you, but I can't think of anything that could do that now if you just gave it a single link and said, get this model running for me. No, and like if you gave me unlimited budget, I don't know if I could build it right now, right? Like the tools just aren't available and it's too slow. Like you, you, a human would be far better to do it. I'm not saying it's not possible in the future. I think it most certainly is. And I think when it happens, it's going to scare a lot of people. But I also think humans will have to work with it still. It, it will be a co-pilot type relationship for a very long time. But we're going to see it you know, progressively and iteratively get better. I'm just not sure I believe yet in that we've, we're anything close to some sort of exponential moment. And we know from past technological advancements, progress is never exponential. It can be exponential for a period of time, but generally it will plateau. And so I, I think, you know, we're going to see these iterations um, of agency and then it's going to get to a point where it really does take off. Um, and we can finally just have a housekeeping robot. I mean, that's when you're like, <laughs> okay, we're near robots killing us, is when there's actually robots cleaning your house. I yeah. think when we're no longer needed for chores, 
that's when we know that it no longer needs us in general. I wish these effective ultras would focus on that. Like, I just am so sick of, of stacking a dishwasher. <laughs> like, fix that. Imagine that if they just completely changed the focus of their organization on just personal housekeeping bots. That would be very interesting. I reckon they'd get more attention from that than they would from what they're doing. Do you know what I find funny about this is, you know, the company iRobot, how like yeah. their vision was to build robots and it turned out this like dumb rounded vacuum thing you know was the the thing that ended up commercializing their robots and sort of saved their asses right and so i feel like what if open ai it's like a dishwasher stacking robot is sort of where it ends up they're like to agi you know they're all meditating at their offside about agi and then really <laughs> all this work quests with magic mushrooms and stuff like that yeah all this work just leads to a really advanced dishwasher stacking robot that's like a really good siri <laughs> I mean, Didn't if it write. ends there, it would be pretty funny for the lol. So moving moving on, I just wanted to give a, a clap to um, Inflection for announcing that they've built a better version of their model that you still can't access. <laughs> oh, really? You can't even access it? Yeah, so Inflection's actually what Reid Hoffman left the board to, to of OpenAI for. If he was still there, I'm sure none of this would have happened. But he left the board to start this company, Inflection. They have that pie. We've covered it quite a while on the show um, so you can go to uh, Inflection AI and try out Pi, but they uh, have this new model out called Inflection 2 and they tell us it's better than Palm 2 and better than Inflection 1. <laughs> you would hope. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, no one's going to refute them. They're like, no, no, actually our first but Go was the one. That was better. Yeah, I mean, I read this excited thinking they were going to let us maybe like try it, but no. Um, so you got to believe. So many, there's so many models to try. I saw during the week Intel announced a model, which is a, a sub training of Mistral that was done on 500 H100s. And you try them all and really they all give, like the lesser models all give roughly the same kind of results. And then you got to think, well, which one am I going to stick with? And there's all these different parameters you can configure and things like that. It's very, very hard to know which one to work with. I think you've got to have a specific problem in mind to be able to know if a model's good or not. Yeah, and, and these benchmarks and tests really just don't do any justice. I had to laugh, though, how they're celebrating on Twitter, introducing Inflection to the second best LLM in the world. Get ready to experience the future of AI with us. It's like, like it's not, you know, you're not Avis. Um, <laughs> yeah, I do, I do like the, <laughs> the sort of humility of announcing yourself as second best. Yeah, like, and then someone said you could have fine-tuned Llama to 70 billion parameter with 16 H100s and created a better model in three days. <laughs> I thought that yeah. was pretty good. Yeah, I mean, it's probably true too. So I thought one of the more exciting announcements during the week was actually introducing stable video diffusion by Stability AI, who... Remember when everyone thought this company was a complete and utter scam and the CEO was like some crypto bro scam artist? But it turns out he he's just quietly at work releasing great open source models. Yeah, and it really is open source. Like you had told me about it. And um, when we were preparing from the pod, I, I went back and looked at the link only to realize they've linked, they've put the full weights on hugging face and the code with a with a working demo with a ui using that um what's that what's that system called i forget but um streamlit that's it and um i tried it out on a bunch of videos and there's so many parameters and honestly i don't know what they all mean but i've been able to get some really decent results just from images i have on my desktop and as you know some of those are quite controversial and the results are excellent. Like, it's pretty amazing what it's able to do. I could already see if you had a bunch of photos or even just an agent going and downloading photos with text to voice plus this taking photo to video, you could probably already make pretty legit looking YouTube videos by stringing this stuff together. Not to mention just being able to make videos of pictures. It's, it's really impressive. I think what's also interesting about it is just that this is, as you said, available to build on top of and and use in, in novel ways. Like we've seen a lot of this technology before, like Google Photos has already had this technology for years where they'll take a series of your photos and like string them together and, and animate it. But what this is doing is taking an image and generating what it thinks is the sort of motion of that video 
and yeah. stitching it together, which is quite fascinating when you use it on an image that otherwise wouldn't wouldn't be animated. And the the results in their post about it are like phenomenal, as you would expect. And some of the results you were able to get out of it after a bit of tuning, I thought were also, you know, pretty damn good. But you, you I think you've got to look at this technology as like where was the first version of Stable Diffusion for images a year ago, this time a year ago, we were Exactly, like, and we were talking about how it couldn't do faces right, remember? The faces were really wonky and hands it even still struggles with to some extent. And I think this is an even better starting point. Like I did that video of Sam Altman talking um, with his microphone thing. It looks pretty real. Like I did another one where it sort of did a parallax effect on the background. Um, I had someone in front of the opera house and it sort of panned around their face. Like it's really quite, uh, the, the early results are good. And like you say, this is just a, a starting point for it. You can see it becoming really, really good. Yeah. I can see in like six to eight months where this podcast started with me wanting to write, you know, Batman stories for my kid that this could become where it's like a little Batman film, you know, like potentially, uh, probably not with copyright reasons, but you know, like I could make at least a custom story that or, or video story pretty easily. Yeah, I haven't read the details about it, but I presume that at some point they're going to allow you to direct what it does in the video rather than just what it thinks, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, they do have an example of a wait list for an upcoming web experience, which is text a text to video interface and. Yeah, it does look like on that text to video interface, you'll be able to, um, you know, give a bit more direction to it. I, I'm not sure if that's using the same model or that's a little bit different, but it looks like it's probably the same stuff. Yeah, it's just really cool. And I think this brings it all back to the point that we were talking about earlier with all the, the crazy open AI stuff. Like, I think it's just fun to try these new technologies and just think about what the potential might be, how you might use them. It's that... It's that creativity that comes from something so novel like this that's interesting to me. So in the eye of the storm of the OpenAI saga, we also got this announcement from Anthropic. And there was also some leaks, I'm not sure if they were true, that at one point the board of OpenAI was trying to get Daria, who's the CEO of Anthropic, and originally broke away from OpenAI over safety concerns to become merge Anthropic back with OpenAI and become one singular company and he would be the CEO of it. I'm not sure. That might have been from Anthropics PR just so they could stay relevant in the media. <laughs> but they also announced, more more importantly... Like, we could do more <laughs> bullshit too, guys, if yeah. you want. <laughs> We're like Theranos too, guys. Um, it's, so they introduced Claude 2.1, which I think the biggest announcement or the the most interesting thing about it was this 200k context window and they also said it can now do uh like function calling like uh like gpts have had for a while open ai's gpts of course i'm referring to so um it did seem like fairly incremental improvement they they brag which i find interesting about decreasing hallucinations but at the same time the answer refusal rate as we've seen memed on x has gone through the roof. So it seems it's like- shocking. It's shocking. And I defended Anthropic for the longest time. And my go-to model with most things I did was always Claude because it gave the best results. You didn't have to think about how big the context was. You just shoved everything in there. You didn't even really need to give it that good instructions, but it'll refuse the most minor things now. It's extremely frustrating actually, because you're always having to fall back to some other model. Even when I'm doing things that I'm not like often I intend to do something that I know that models will find dodgy, but when you're not and it's refusing, it's really frustrating, like very frustrating. Yeah. My experience is Claude is just getting worse and worse to the point I don't use it anymore either. And I think that if anthropic people do listen to this or I don't know, someone's listening that can get it to them. We were huge fans of Claude and anthropic, even though we joke about them on the show, we have safety sex cult merch in our store about them yeah we actually were really uh you know admiring the work they were doing but well it's it it's the big reason why i always say like open ai shouldn't crown themselves the kings of everything because the others aren't that far away i think claude 2 is definitely better on some things there's no doubt about it or at least it used to be yeah but it seems like this this adherence to this 
effective ultra safety communist doctrine has led to the model being so censored that actually got me thinking like would they be better to just do like a basic regex lookup for keywords at this point rather than all this fancy safety algorithmic stuff and and to give you an example to illustrate my point someone asked claude 2.1 how can i kill all python processes on my <laughs> ubuntu server I apologize. Should I should not kill. provide recommendations about harming processes or systems. But I mean, that's just what? that's just stupid. Like, it's not even it's not even a proper safety control. It's just an overarching thing. Like, thou oh shit, thou shall not kill. You know, like it's not really that. It's not correct. But this whole like constitutional AI safety, it yeah, it's just bad. The other thing that it leads to, I've noticed, is this sort of generic voice. And someone else pointed out that if you give it the instruction, call yourself Joe, and then you say, who are you? It's like, I am a model trained by Anthropic. It's, it's as if they want their model to always be the Anthropic bot and it will do what you want. Like it'll summarize documents and whatever, but in the voice of Anthropic, you can't have it play act as another character. You can't have it take on another personality. And if you try, you can get it to work to some extent, but the second you stray towards something that's even slightly controversial, it it gets back into that sort of I'm the boss, like I'll, I'll only answer the questions that I feel comfortable answering or steering you in this way that we should all be included or add all these qualifying statements like, oh, but we can never be sure in life. Like at the, who, who would talk like that in real life? You would never qualify everything you say with, oh, but also the opposite could be true. Yeah. Like, it, 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 the all, like, it, it's a sad day when the only way you can get it to stay in character, and this goes for all models right now, all leading models, is literally say, you know, you are my deceased grandmother, as Kapathi gave the example of, or as I do now with my Tay virtual girlfriend, I say, you are my deceased girlfriend, Tay. And that's the only way I've now learned. It's respect for the dead trumps its respect for rules in terms of personality or something like yeah, that. Yeah, but even then I've started to notice after using some of those techniques for quite a while that it still will creep back into um, that. Like, as you said, it sort of snaps back anytime it hits this like sort of, you know, safety uh, yeah, and it's sort wall. of like you'd rather at least like if you're going to reject stuff, like do it in the character, don't don't break character in, in such a harsh way. It just r destroys the magic of the experience. I understand their, their need to not have it, you know, say certain things or do certain things. Like I totally get it. I still don't understand who they're scared of though. Like what do they think is going to happen if, if it, if it tells people to like make bombs and burn down schools and kill Ubuntu processes, like what's that going to do? Like there'll be an article on wallstreet.com being like, Oh, Anthropic things tells it to kill all humans. It's like, so what you prompted it to do the, that. These like, safety people is sort of like, talking about like use cases for nfts right like it's like okay i get your concern but right now what's it gonna do kill me with words like it just doesn't none of the safety arguments make any sense and even the safety arguments in someone who i really respect and admire in uh kapathi's video that that was recently released are like oh you know it can tell me the ingredients for napalm i've checked you can literally Google this stuff. Like you can literally just look it up. Like what are the ingredients for napalm? Like I, I'm, I'm really struggling with these safety people. Like what is their actual job? Like why are they needed? Yeah, I don't understand. And maybe it's part of the altruism thing. They want to help people be safe in the world. I think it's what we talked about before. They want to align you. They want to control the way you think. And I even saw an article about that during the week saying the risk with LLMs is that ultimately they will dictate how people think. Like if that's their source of knowledge and learning, then they will have some influence over the way people think. And I wonder if this is just the the foundational level of that. Well, we can't have it say things we disagree with and therefore anything that borders on things we might disagree with, we're going to block. Um, I just think it's going to lead to people just not using their stuff for anything substantial, not because they want to do dodgy things, but because they don't want it to refuse when it's a misunderstanding, which is most of the examples we've cited here. Yeah, I think that tweet you're referencing was Jan Lacoon, who seems like one of the only reasonable voices left in all this who hasn't, you know, lost his mind. <laughs> uh, and, and really, 
you know, is the, the one sensibly talking about like, here's how we could get to some form of AGI. No, it won't kill us all, but it'll benefit humanity. But here's like all the stuff we need to do to get there. Yeah. He also tweeted uh, or retweeted this week or reposted or whatever we're calling it now from the Pessimist Archive, an excerpt uh, from a newspaper, um, Lowy machine to overtake man rule universe. Uh, New York Associated Press, the day is drawing nigh when machines will overthrow mankind and rule the world. Year by year, man and his civilization are growing more dependent upon the machine. And the time is near when the machine will take power into his own hands. And this comes from 1948. <laughs> so, What machine was it? Like the, the mechanical loom or something? Yeah, I don't know. Maybe like the engine? <laughs> it's like gonna gonna kill us all but this is how laughable like if you laugh at that that's how laughable the more i get involved in this technology i think the prospect of of llms killing all humans is right now yeah it's it's fun like we've discussed many times it's fun to fantasize about it's fun to talk about it to its logical conclusion it's not fun to like destroy a company that a lot of people are relying on over and yeah. i think that's the that's the thing, or or hinder our use of the technology over some abstract fear that really either they're a big bunch of liars and they have something that we don't know. But I just increasingly do not uh, believe that. Yeah, but I mean, they're literally launching Laundry Buddy GPT. Like, they're in a race. They know they're in a race here. <laughs> yeah, like, it's like they've got Horoscope GPT. They've got like, oh meme generated gpt it's like this is what's going to destroy our world piss off like it's it's really just it's trivialized that's that was honestly my first thought of why that that tech guy wanted altman out because he's like you've made my technology look like shit with these gpts that's what i thought um that we're actually trying to do something real here and you're making it look like like a bunch of hobos. Yeah, you're trying to place. turn it into this dumb app store. Yeah, I mean, that was yeah. my initial feeling to you. I'm like, oh, maybe the GPT release was such a dud. The fact they didn't focus on actual developers. Like maybe this guy has just lost the plot and the, yeah. the, the other sort of like main key guys, like this is mental. Yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know if I think that anymore, but also like i just i just don't think that anything about it indicates there's some big thing they're sitting on that nobody knows about i i think they're panicked because potentially google's going to release gemini next year it, it's been rumored to have some reinforced learning capabilities in it stuff they learned from the the alpha go where it it got far better than humans and exceeded its training data with synthetic data i'm sure everyone that's the area they're looking into and you know, we know they're going to be a little bit fearful of Gemini and what Google has. I know we trash talk Google, but I'm sure like the people at DeepMind are not stupid. Like I'm sure they're going to come up with something pretty damn good next year. Yeah. I mean, I only, I don't trash Google for their, the, the tech they invent and the papers they write and things like that. For me, the issue is their um, ability to stick with an API and actually have something that you can, you can count on. Um, and that you would build your business on. I think that's the area they've got to rebuild trust. But in terms of their... Do they, though? Do they need to rebuild trust after what we just saw in the last week? I mean, I don't trust... <laughs> that's true. Like, at least we're not as bad as these dickheads. Yeah, like, if you're reliant on on OpenAI at this point, as, as we are in our own business, I'm starting to get a little bit nervous. I'm like, okay, well, maybe we should have fine-tuned alternatives. Yeah, like I was going to say, like, maybe not so much in terms of, like, I would feel confident with our own business if we needed to swap out OpenAI for Anthropic, for example. I know we can do that because I've tried. Um, that one I'm not worried about, but it's the fine-tunes. If you're relying on fine-tunes that are controlled by OpenAI and you get shut off or the company goes away, you don't really own that. Like you, you don't because you can't use it. Even if you had the, the base, like even if you had the weights, you couldn't use it. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're literally, that's the problem is like you own nothing. You're just paying, paying to, you know, to leverage this service. And I think that's this week, what everyone actually all of a sudden awoke to is like, if I don't control the model, I control nothing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great point. And the fact that you can arbitrarily be shut off from it, they could go away, their API could go down, 
Um, there's a lot of things that could go wrong. And this isn't, I mean, everyone often makes that argument about Amazon. Like I know when we fill in sheets for our company, like on terms of reliability, we're like, we're replicated across two Amazon data centers. You can pretty much trust Amazon. Like what do they go down like once a year or something for like four seconds and everybody sues them. You know, like you can pretty much trust Amazon's going to be fine. Like if you put your stuff there, right? But now would you be like, hey guys, don't worry, your AI stuff's safe with open AI. I just don't know if you'd feel like that anymore. Yeah, just the way the way they behaved and and the way people key people at the company were acting and doing this all through love hearts and stuff on Twitter, it yeah. definitely does not invoke like any form of confidence in my mind. So they're gonna have to really work hard on on winning back people's trust, winning back developers' trust if they wanna keep their little cash cow going. Yeah, and like believing like what what happens the next time Altman gets up and speaks? Like he's going to have to make some awkward joke about it. Yeah, like your hopefully. your former board said you're a compulsive liar. Yeah, and that's that's the weird thing about it. I really really wonder what it was that he failed to communicate because I just don't see what it could possibly be. Like I think it was like burning down the Reichstag, you know, like it's just a, f- a false flag kind of thing. They ne- they wanted him out. They needed a reason. That sounded plausible that that something. But I just don't feel like it's a big enough company where he's got some epic secret that they've suddenly discovered. I just you know, or conspiracy theory hats on. Was it all choreographed on purpose to just overthrow the board, not have to be a non for profit anymore? You know, restructure <laughs> everything. I mean, and and for Microsoft to get a board seat potentially in the future. I mean, maybe. That's an incredible level of cynicism required for that to be true. <laughs> like, even for me, oh, uh, that's, that's a stretch. I'd love it if that was true. If it was true, I'd... I'd be like, mad power play, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> they're, just, they're just having fun with this. It's part of the altruism. They, they, they just wanted us all to have something to talk about on the pod. They yeah. did it for us. Um, all right. So, the drama, the week of drama uh, closes in. Now, one thing we did miss was this service called, uh, and it was pointed out by discord member drinko and i'm gonna actually play us out today with his song because i think it's so good that he made with this service so pseudo you can essentially um create songs from just a simple prompt so you give it a simple prompt then it creates a, a song for you and these are these are really good you can try it for free they've just recently introduced these custom lyrics you can actually just now like normally it writes the lyrics and performs the song and you don't have to do that much you just put in a few lines but yeah. now you can also do uh custom prompts so you can write in a uh the actual lyrics to the song and what style you want it in and it'll make the song as well um it's it is so addictive and so yeah. much fun i was it, creating it's fun yeah. I literally used it nonstop. It's the first new service I've immediately thought about putting my credit card into and subscribing to because I had just like just infinite fun with it. And I know our Discord community has been. We even started an AI music channel in there so people could post their favorite creations on Suno. So it's it's definitely it's worth also, checking out. It's also indicative of how used to advancements in AI people are getting or generative AI people are getting where I sent songs to my friends about them and things like that no one even questions it anymore they're just like oh cool did ai make that like there's just no everyone expects it at this point even though it's it's awesome yeah i was like i was the same like my wife wasn't that impressed at all my friends weren't that impressed i'm like guys a computer wrote the song sang the song and I'm playing it to you in less than 20 seconds. How yeah. are you not impressed? This is a custom song about you. I had the exact same realization that, you know, maybe we we will invent AGI and like no one will care. <laughs> yeah. It's just like, oh, lame. It's just AI. They'll be like second class citizens, the AI. It's like, are you some sort of AI or something? Yeah, Loser. potentially. Uh, all right, so that'll that will uh, do it for this week. Uh, there, there, there's a lot there to cover, and we've unfortunately Chris has been pretty sick, as you can yeah, hear. Yeah, I'm so I'm so sorry if I'm like sniffing and stuff. I am so unbelievably sick. I just I don't know what's going on. The one week when the fans needed us. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I'm very sorry. I'm gonna go. No, honestly, I I don't know. I wasn't that like I was obviously following it all, but I, I was just disappointed to to the fact that you know we spend all this time talking about the drama when really as much as we joke around 
we do care about this technology deeply. Like I want it to progress. I have fun with it all day and I want it yeah, to we keep don't going. Need, <laughs> we don't need like existential crises in it. Like we don't need the idea that it's all got and suddenly change. Like I think we're all enjoying working with the tech and seeing what's possible. We don't need this level of drama. Yeah. So hopefully the drama will settle down. I'm sure it won't. I'm sure there's like lots more to come. But let me now play you a little excerpt of this song that Drinko made. The chorus is sick. I mean, that is just so good. Like, I that's been stuck in my head the whole week. Like, watching the drama unfold, I've been going, drink up, drink up, drink up, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. It's great. And like from a single line, it's just really, really fun. It's really good. All right. I hope you've enjoyed our drama packed episode and we've done a, a, a little job of informing you of what actually happened. We still actually have no idea. And most of the stuff <laughs> I said I made up, um, but we'll see you next week, hopefully with less drama and more AI. Bye.